Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 855. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 7th, 2024. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our computers and discuss the news of the week. We try and do this twice a week. We often do this once a week. That's just how the uh, how our schedules work. Sometimes I have guests on. We had uh, Terry Maddenly uh, on our last uh, show, and that got some good reception. We appreciate that. But in general, it's just George and I talking about the news, what's going on out there. And there's some good stories because the primates got together. But before we talk about that, uh, we alluded last week that, you know, hey, keep us in your prayers. Uh, we're at the forefront of news, and and uh, that certainly draws the attention of our enemy. And, uh, um, pff, hey, it, it's been a rough week for both of us. Uh, and without telling you guys too much, uh, uh, we've had some uh, fiscal changes here at the Carlson household as my uh, wife uh, got laid off last week from uh, her employer. She's quickly being offered other jobs that's not a big deal my stress level is about way down here not a big deal uh her stress level because she loves to work is <laughs> launch mode <laughs> george you've been having some uh, uh some stressful situations as well what's going on with family you? oh family issues mm -hmm. uh my daughter's has some difficulties and i'm going to have to go out to seattle this week and bring her home mm-hmm uh, pack her, pack up her apartment, settle her affairs, and help things uh, move to a new phase in her life. And uh, it's always stressful when these things happen. As I've discovered in my my fifty eight years on Earth here, the unknown is always stressful, and uh, it's it, it's so wonderful that I can take uh, my God and my relationship uh, with the Godhead into those unknown situations. Uh, it reduces my stress. It helps me have a perspective as a servant. Uh, and it, it usually changes stressful situations into Kevin being able to uh, be who I am uh, created to be. And I love that about uh, being a Christian. Uh, however, there is a lot of uncertain situations that, that exist out there. And uh, everybody reacts differently to them. And we would ask that uh, you as a viewer, don't send us money this week. No, 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 we don't need your money right now. We would, we covet your prayers, that you would keep us uh, in your prayers. Not that we would avoid stress, but we would handle it as, uh, as men of God. And uh, I will tell you right now, both George and I have done that in the last two weeks. We uh, have been uh, certainly listening and, and seeing what's going on out there, and your prayers have helped tremendously. And we will continue to do Anglican Unscripted and everything, regardless of what happens. Because this is the unknown. We're making it known to you. Anglican primates fly to Rome, meet the Pope. Big story. Headlines. I can't believe it. They didn't quite swim the Tiber, thank goodness. But um, it was a great news story. We read the press releases out of uh, the, the Church of England and the Anglican Communion Office said this was just amazing. The band is back together. Look at this wonderful purple picture with all these primates just loving on each other and praying up and storming up the world. And I'm like, well, that's kind of cool, but is that the whole story? Uh, I counted 30 of 42 provinces were present. And uh, I see that they were there to, uh, uh, they were offered the chance to decide on the new leadership of the Anglican Communion, but they declined to do so, presumably because they love Justin Welby, George. Is that true? What's going on here? It is true that they declined yeah. a proposal, but it is not true that is the reason. Um, what we're seeing is, this is Justin Welby's Roman holiday. Mm -hmm. This We're seeing the vicar's slides of his trip to the Holy Land and to Rome, his meeting with the Pope, um, all these sort of things. And the things they told us they talked about were climate change and you know, war and whatnot. What they did not talk about was the elephant in the room. They didn't talk about the LLF process in the Church of England, for example. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they did not talk about uh, the fact that uh, that this is the largest boycott of any primates meeting. And those who were not there represent 70% of the Anglican world's population. So the those who were not there um, basically have shown this up to be a bit of a fraud, a bit of a farce. Now, the press reports were, it, it, the, it was very tightly scripted. It, when I first started covering this in the 90s, you know, you couldn't go to the meeting itself, but when they would break for lunch, you could have talk to them, chat with them, have dinner with them. And, you know, Kevin, you and I once sat down with Rowan Williams sure. and he, he teased us saying that we had horns. And I said, I, you know, what are you trying to tell us there? And, uh, but, uh, but the point was that there was no hiding. Uh, this was a bona fide attempt for the leaders of the community to meet and to formulate things here they wouldn't tell they they started off by refusing to say who was there and who wasn't there and so we had a little kremlinology game where you have a picture and you try to decipher who's who in the picture well who's this chinese man he's not the archbishop of hong kong and he's not the archbishop of southeast asia could he be the korean no here's the korean in other words that sort of thing oh, oh where is hong kong oh you, all that sort of stuff and you know we figured out this is the stand-in for hong kong this woman is the stand-in for Michael Curry, who's ill. Mm -hmm. And if you include the stand-ins, 30 out of 42 were there. But they wouldn't say anything, and they said it's a secret. And what, what they wanted to do was they wanted to direct the news coverage of the meeting so that it's all sunshine and roses and baby's breath and things like that. But what what's wrong no. with that? I mean, it, in reality, if you're trying to control the situation and you're in uh, a in Rome, it's not your property. It, it belongs to the, the Roman Catholic Church, and you're there as an invitation to the Pope. You kind of want to present, you know, there's nothing wrong here, guys. And uh, but didn't the Pope allude to, hey, we all need to get along? Francis and Welby both spoke about the need to deepen Anglican Roman Catholic relations, work towards visible unity, which, if you think about it, is a bit farcical because here we've got over two thirds of Anglicans not represented because their leaders are boycotting the meeting. Mm -hmm. While Welby's talking about let's get closer to Rome, well, Justin, get closer to those Anglicans who haven't come. There should be a sense of priority. Um, there was a, the International Anglican Unity, Faith, and Order Commission, the UFO, UFO Commission, yeah. unfortunately named, put forward a proposal about this is how we need to reform the instruments of the communion. Perhaps the Archbishop of Canterbury, his role would be taken up by a leader elected by the primates. And we would do this with the Anglican Consultative Council and do that with the other instruments. And it was uh, voted down. It didn't really get a lot of support. Well, this was basically spun as a mark of uh, appreciation and admiration for Justin Welby, and we're going to ask him to do more stuff. Well, no, that's not true. What It was true that this was voted down, but the reason why it was voted down depended upon who you asked. For the traditionally minded primates who were there, and that included Kenya and Southeast Asia, um, as well as their confreres uh, in Gafcon and the Global South, anything coming out of Lambeth Palace or the Anglican Consultative Council's offices in London is dead on arrival. Oh, it can't be so. It, it can't be trusted. so. Commission, whose members were appointed by Justin Welby and Justin Welby's minions, has no. You know they could they could give everything the Global South wanted, but the Global South would still say, "No, we don't trust." It. And the liberals who are in the who hold all the instruments of power in the communion, they don't want any change. So you had uh, the conservatives rejecting out of hand who was offering the plan, while the liberals don't want any change. So of course it's going to fail. So that's and but see that's different from how it's being spun in the press and what the what you heard in the press conferences, which is 
how much we love Justin, you know, Justin Welby. I'm, re I'm reminded of that, that passage from the movie, The Manchurian Candidate. Justin Welby is the kindest, sweetest, most wonderful man in the world. You know, they're all brainwashed after cool. having been held captive in North Korea. I was still uh, thinking about Audrey Hepburn from Roman Holiday. Now you're switching to uh, uh, some, did I say yeah. Audrey? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Manchurian, but yeah. So, so the from a picture post from a Life magazine perspective, a successful meeting, a lot of pretty pictures mm -hmm. with men and women in fancy dress, with Francis, with Swiss guards, with works of art. Boy, this is something neat to put in the parish, you know, newsletter. Look what's happening in the world today. If we're talking about substantive reform and change and renewal, this was another step backwards, another step into further chaos and anarchy where the majority have saying, we are not going to play by the minority who's in control's rules. We're going to have, there's going to be a head on crash at a certain point. This uh, did nothing to avert that crash. In well, fact, I think it actually heightened tensions. It, well, it may have heightened it. I think it just reveals the new status quo. You know, we're not going to play Justin Welby's reindeer games. We're going to uh, continue on with a GAFCON and the Global South-centric um, leadership, and we're going to do it that way. GAFCON has said, hey, we're not doing politics anymore. We're going to do the evangelical side of Anglicanism and, and grow the communion through that way. And the Global South says, we'll take it up. We'll try and, as best we can, work within the system. But if we need to work outside the system, we'll do it. You know, because uh, they now have clearly at 70% uh, boycotting this, the numbers to do what they want to do. And the only people who are going to give Justin Welby the time of day are the BBC and the Western media. The rest of us have moved on. I've moved on. George, have you? Well, the the Western media couldn't give a darn. Oh, right there. This is this had yeah. terrible coverage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was only in the religious press, and the religious press, by and large, uh, is a, is a client of its master. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, a little little anecd vignette anecdote about you know so the inside stuff that in a normal year you would see in the normal times. Uh, uh, the Mexican church put out a press statement saying that the man at the meeting who says he's the Archbishop of Mexico is not the Archbishop of Mexico because he's been he was deposed, deposed yeah. and a and a civil court has affirmed his deposition yet and we've told everybody this at in London but they still invited the the imposter and you know, I put out this, I republished the press statement. Uh, I'm at the point in my life and ministry where I don't need to, you know, give my thought on every single thing that comes across my desk by writing. I say, you know, here's what the Mexicans say and Same let true. people decide if they want to believe it or not. Well, within an hour or so, I got a, an email back from a Mexican bishop saying, gosh, that was quick. We've been, in, you know, we've had Lambeth, we've had the ACC back in touch with us. You know, as you know, within the hour after our press release went live on Anglican Inc. Um, well, what did they say? The, what what did the well, office well, say about inviting the wrong archbishop? Well, I think the Mexicans wanted to keep it under their hat, but they mm -hmm. just wanted to basically say that uh, somebody reads your stuff. Uh, <laughs> besides, <laughs> it's not my wife. It's not your wife. It's not my children. <laughs> Uh, but somebody yeah. out there reads it, and uh, that Lambeth Palace uh, felt the need to make nice with the real Mexican Archbishop and his people, not the, the one that they, uh, through idiocy, invited. Okay, well, you posted this week a response from GAFCON uh, to the meeting that took up between Oh, I can't even talk today. That took uh, place in Rome with the Anglicans. Uh, they said... A, the primates meeting were unrepresentative of the majority of the communion, and that this is the largest boycott of an Anglican primates meeting ever. Ever. So uh, what else do they say, George? Well, they said, you know, any, any reform efforts coming out of the primates meeting and the Anglican Consultative Council 
or dead on arrival, mm -hmm. dead on arrival, because what needs to come first before any structural changes are repentance yeah. and rebuilding and re-strengthening the faith. If So the, the GAFCOM primates were saying that, look, we've got to get right with God before we set up another bureaucratic structure. Um, the current Anglican communion is the last vestige of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, and we're seeing as, you know, Harold Macmillan would say the winds of change are blowing through Africa. Well, politically they did 50, 60 years ago. Now, theologically and, and in the terms of the life of the church, they're blowing right now. And there's a hurricane and a gale going on. Some primates who are African like to play both sides. Albert Chama is Central Africa. He is always invited to these meetings. He's a supporter of Welby. But the Central Africans uh, are very strong against all of Welby's uh, uh, initiatives. Yeah. Women, clergy, homosexuality, gay marriage. You know, what they say at home is not what they say at meetings in London. Why is that? Because they get a lot of money from the USPG and they are a poor country. Poor country. Zimbabwe, Zambia are not, you know, bread, not. No, nope. really wealthy places. So, you know, for them, there's the calculated statement. Tanzania, uh, Mendola, Archbishop uh, in Mendola invited Justin Welby to Zanzibar this weekend. And I got a tip from, an, Zan, uh, from a Tanzanian bishop and I asked Lambeth Palace. They said, we'll get back to you. And then half hour later, I got a press release saying Welby's in uh going to come to Zanzibar this weekend and priest at Christchurch Cathedral Stonetown. That's it. We've well, been there. My, That's a beautiful place. Yeah. We, yeah. And then I got a, another email from another Tanzanian bishop saying, well, there are 12 Tanzanian bishops are going to boycott this over the LLF process. In other words, what the Church of England has done, you've got a, at least a dozen Tanzanian bishops saying, we cannot meet with this man. So what does it say? Yeah, the Archbishop of Tanzania went to the meeting. He's in the smiley, smiley picture, but over at least half of his bishops will not even go to the same room as Justin Welby because of the stance of the Church of England on gay marriage and all this stuff. Well, that gives me hope because we've always said, you know, one of the biggest struggles with uh, some of these African primates is they have to deal with the problems in, in their provinces first before they can deal with international politics. And that it's not surprising that sometimes uh, African nations, provinces change their affiliation to GAFCON uh, every time there's a new primate uh, uh, mm -hmm. elected. Not surprising. However, it gives me so much hope that people at the priest, priest, clergy, and bishops level are still so informed. You know that they they go to Anglican Inc., they watch Anglican Unscripted, and they know what's happening in the world of Anglican politics, and they're not going to be there just for the picture. For some people, the picture is important. For a lot of bishops in Tanzania, not so much. Not so much. Uh, let's see here. Did we cover everything from GAFCON? I think we did. Uh, we talked last week in our last show about uh, the Watch Commission that wants to completely eliminate any signature of uh, mutual flourishing where men and women can play together and clerics and we all get along not so much anymore under watch's command they want to end that and the anglo-catholic bishops in the church of england have responded george what they say well three bishops uh, philip north uh, martin uh, warner and uh, jonathan baker and that's uh, uh burn uh, burnley uh, chichester and fulham yep in london they're all Anglo-Catholics. They're members of the society. They wrote a letter to the editor to the Church Times in response to the article the Church Times had reporting on the meeting at St. John's Waterloo two Saturdays ago of Watch, Women in the Church, and Rose Hudson Wilkin, the Bishop of Dover's speech and talk where she basically says, as you mentioned, you know, we've given them 10 years to come around and support women clergy. Now, we're not going to, you know, now we're going to make you do it. Mm -hmm. And in a very polite way, the three Anglo-Catholic bishops uh, said, 
the the initial and the words are the initials F and uh, what's the uh, Y Y Y yes uh, um, yeah <laughs> that you know who who do you think you are Rose Hudson Wilkin you know dictating the Catholic faith based upon your rather lamentable and laughable level of uh, theological acumen and uh, and uh, experience so what it's so. As we mentioned last week, I said this was overreaching by watch. It showed desperation. And the normally supine uh, Anglo-Catholics, um, bishops, this stiffened their spine in a way that nothing has in a long, long time. And now they are basically in the fight. So if you, I basically, if I were a conservative insider in the Church of England, I would send a gift card, gift certificate, to Rose Hudson Wilkins because you finally got Jonathan Baker and company to do the right thing after having been on the fence all these years. Okay, here's my bigger problem. No, not a peep from anybody else. This could have been a great opportunity for uh, Justin Welby's office to say, hey, wait a minute here. We still believe in mutual field flourishing. Clearly they don't. Clearly they think Watch is on the right side of history here. Uh, this would have been a great time for some uh, popular... Uh, bishops within the Church of England to say, wait a minute here, we made an agreement, can't we just stick with a, a, another generation? These oldie fogies, will they'll, they'll die off sometime. And just wait for them to die off, don't kick them out yet. The, the silence, except from the Anglo-Catholic bishops, is surprising to me, George. We're disappointing. I guess I, I don't want to say surprising, it's disappointing. What can one say about what the bishops of the Church of England that hasn't been said? <laughs> You're right. All right. Um, for people who do not know, I was uh, raised in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin has, up until this point, three dioceses. There was Fond du Lac, Milwaukee, and Eau Claire. And uh, they have decided to merge. One of my roommates worked for the Diocese of Fond du Lac for many years. And I recently saw on Facebook he's moved to Illinois because I think his job was cut because they're they're kind of going to be doing some consolidation. You don't need three bishops, three offices, three communications people uh, to run a diocese anymore. Let's talk about the new diocese of Wisconsin. George, what's going on there? Yeah, they had their final diocesan conventions to agree to merge the three dioceses. Now we just have to get it rubber stamped by general convention. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a portent of things to come in the Episcopal Church. Wisconsin had been, you know, good Episcopal territory for the, most of the 20th century. Anglo-Catholic territory, you know, Episcopal, it, it, it had a very substantial history. The seminary Neshota House is located there. And these three, this merged three dioceses will only have about 10,000 people in it, communicants which is actually smaller than what we have here in central Florida. Well, yes, people move to Florida. They don't move to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Uh, I did. I moved to Florida. I guess that counts. Well, <laughs> so, but we're going to see this. We have, like, New York has the diocese of Ro uh, Western New York, Rochester, Central New York, Albany, New York, and Long Island. Only New York and Long Island really are viable long term. The rest of them have got to merge, or Kansas and Western Kansas, or Massachusetts and Western Massachusetts, and California. Uh, San Joaquin, after the Acne Diocese left, is basically the Tech San Joaquin Diocese is really just a, a it, it's not viable. And Oregon and Eastern Oregon. Washington and Olympia, all these places where there were two dioceses or more in states, there's not the uh, money or the people to maintain this. So this is the first major consolidation. The next one might be in Pennsylvania or in New York. We'll see. Um, well, but it is just a recognition that the old ways are dead and gone. This has been a big topic for the last two years. You know, the, the growth of the ACNA and the decline of the Episcopal Church. And at some point, they're going to be, or this way or whatever. And um, it's going to cross, but it, it's hard to watch. Wisconsin was a strong place 
to go to an Episcopal church, Eau Claire, amazing churches, uh, Fond du Lac, amazing churches. And their heyday was the 70s. Since then, there's been a slow decline uh, in attendance. And I, you know, I can't imagine your, your Midwest Wisconsin farmer not going to church, but their ch the children stopped going to church. And uh, that's been the now, biggest decline I can see. Wisconsin, they've had a windfall, a financial windfall, that a uh, convent uh, was, re was sold and the, the religious order of uh, nuns uh, turned the seven and a half million dollars over the Episcopal Diocese of Wisconsin. So they, they've got money to keep the machine roll going, uh, a slim down machine, but even that's going to run out uh, sooner rather than later. All right. So let's move on to some of the news. Diocese of Leicester has signed an agreement with the Unite Union. Let's go Union. Let, what, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not a union supporter. What's going on, George? Huh. Again, this is a recognition of the failure of the leadership of the Church of England. Uh, the Diocese of Leicester signed an agreement with Unite the Union, which is a union that includes, has a religious workers uh, division. Mm -hmm. And as I recall from our gospel readings, we had Jesus, the 12 apostles, and their labor and their union rep. Um, the, the, the leadership of the Church of England, bishops, archdeacons, the offices are so estranged from the average, you know, workaday worker that the average workaday worker needs union representation in their bargaining and in, you know, their relations because the, they don't trust the bosses. Um, this for a clergy person may or may not be a good idea. Um, Unite has made it quite clear that they have a left liberal agenda so that a priest, uh, so it's already been asked of Unite, uh, if you have a clergy member who is fired because they don't support gay marriage or if the church tries to squeeze them out because they're against women clergy, will, you, will Unite support them? Unite has said, no, we will not. So it's a one-way thing. Uh, they'll support conserv liberals in conservative fights, and then they'll support people in discipline and payroll stuff. But it just speaks to the dysfunction and failure of the bishops as a class, as a group of people in England, to lead the church and their clergy. Because is not the diocese itself supposed to be a quasi-union? Isn't it where so, the, the structure is set up? how much you're going to get paid, the communications, the health care, where you're going to work, how long you're going to work. It, it's a quasi-union. You shouldn't have to go outside that union to have yourself represented. But, you know, we've heard so many horror stories of, let's say, you, you're, you live in a rectory and the rectory has holes in the roof and the stove doesn't work. And, you know, you basically live in a place that otherwise the landlord would be be taken to court for not providing hab habitable uh, housing. Slumlord? But You're saying they're slumlords. Slumlord. Okay. But because the Church of England is exempt from a lot of that stuff, they don't mm -hmm. get beaten up by that. But it, but instead of putting money into housing their clergy, well, we need more diversity officers. We need uh, another you know interfaith advisor. We need more women's advisor. In other words, money in English dioceses are spent first to maintain the machine and the center and the parishes are seen as sources of income which to support uh, diocese diocese and officers are essentially parasites in the body of christ at this stage of life in the church of england they provide nothing really um, of uh, value and we've reached the point where there needs to be collective bargaining with these people on behalf of the clergy because things are so awful. Deep sigh. I mean, George and I have stressful things in your life. This, some of the news we reported on, just the lives of clergy in the Church of England are much more stressful than our lives, George. Uh, just to say the least. Let's move on to our last story. It may be a story that takes us a half an hour to talk about. You remember the Arab Spring, George? What, you remember what was that? The Arab Spring. Remember that? 
Yes, yes. Yeah, so we used to see uh, nations in the Middle East trying to fight for freedom, and there was a, a, a time in in our in our world where uh, slowly some nations did. It was kind of fun to watch, but it was a stressful situation for those trying to maintain power. We now have the Hamas Spring, George. That's what I'm going to call this. And in the Hamas Spring, uh, college campuses here in the West, uh, North America, have tried to keep Hamas alive. And in doing so, they've done protests on campuses. They've set up tent cities. They've defied the orders of the deans of the universities. They've involved the press. Um, and they've involved the unions. And they've involved every other left-wing uh, entity to help support them. And slowly, some of these universities are taking back control. Uh, UCLA took back a little bit of control. Uh, uh, Princeton took back control. They didn't really have any trouble in Princeton. Um, Columbia, we've talked about, they took back control and tried to clear the campus. They've canceled graduation ceremonies. And lo and behold, we complained a couple of weeks ago, why aren't these churches on campuses responding to the news? We just got word that the Episcopal Church on uh, the campus of Columbia has put out a statement. George, what do they want to help, help with here? Oh, Kevin, what would be an Episcopal story without, what would be an Anglican story without idiocy from the Episcopal Church? At the pro, after the moment it passed, after that was broken up, after it's been shown to be influenced by outside agitators, after students have barred the way to forbidding Jews from entering into campus, mm -hmm. you know, you know, all these horrible things, death to Jews, death to whites, death to the police from yeah. these agitators. And the police start to evict the Columbia students based, and the Episcopal uh, Diocese in New York says, well, we want to provide a safe space for these protesters at the Cathedral St. John the Divine next to Columbia's campus. We're going to offer sanctuary? Is that the... Is, yeah. oh. <laughs> so we're... So, we're going to back the wrong side after the battle has been lost by this side. I mean, this, uh, you can't be any more gormless than the Episcopal Church leadership is at times. They, uh, I mean, these, these people are just loons. They I mean, are. What can, but, I mean, they're not known for taking the right side of a lot of issues. So to take the, the, it, the side of the uh, Jew haters, not that surprising. You know, well, and I hate, I hate to sound like Gavin Ashenden, but look at what the Catholics did. The Catholic chaplain at Columbia put out a statement saying, I don't recognize these people. These aren't students. These are outside agitators. There may be a few students, but this is predominantly run by outside professional agitators. And this is a Moss demonstration that's moved to upper, Man upper Manhattan. And the Episcopal Church says, well, that's okay. We'll we'll invite the Hamas demonstrators over to the cathedral. Well, good luck getting them out, folks. Uh, it couldn't the, happen to a better bunch of people. Sometimes I, just I know. Think, I just you know. I mean the entirety of the scripture that they seem to think they reference to is all founded uh, in. The Middle East in Israel, but whatever, you know, just it drives me crazy. I, I'm just my my thoughts are wandering here because that it's like the stupidest thing I've heard this week. So, all right, so okay, this won't take that long to uh, to cover, I guess. So, um, the the Catholics, the Roman Catholics, were on the right side of this. The Episcopal Church was way. Let's talk a little bit about um, long term here. The elephant in the back of the room here is. We can only recognize uh, the Anglican Communion at a certain level as ecumenical w between each other. GAFCON and the Global South and the Anglican leadership seem to be looking for an ecumenical relationship down the road, but nothing more. They're not looking for fellowship. They're not looking for what they had 20, 30, 40 years ago, George. No, nope. Yeah. Uh, we have gone different ways, and we have, in many cases, different faiths. Mm -hmm. um, so I get emails all the time, you know, are there any conservatives of Episcopalian churches? And I say, you know, come to Central Florida, and uh, we have 
90 parishes and there's only one that I would say is uh, dodgy. Yeah. You go to other places, then, uh, well, I would say we have one good parish out of 90 dodgy parishes. Um, we're so fractured. Uh, you know, the old joke about Central Florida um, is that it's the church of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, for example, I have a friend who I studied with who's been married five times, who's an Episcopal priest. If I said to my bishop, uh, Bishop, I'm going to leave my wife and marry my secretary and get a divorce, the bishop would say to me, uh, well, then you would need to explore your vocation as a taxi driver. Uber, um, Uber. Yeah. Uber driver. There are more you know, divorced and remarried bishops in the uh, House of Bishops than there are rectors who are divorced and remarried in the Diocese of Central Florida. That's just one issue. That's not even the issue. Yeah. But we, we have such different faiths. I have much more in common with Gavin Ashenden, though I disagree on some things. Some itty bitty But I do, yeah. than I do with many, many Episcopal leaders and clergy. Mm -hmm. And you know, Gavin has more in common with me than Father James Martin and th that wing of the Catholic Church. Well, it, it's interesting you know, that we're at this time now that uh, so much of the church, and let's list the denominations, Lutheran, Anglican, Episcopalian, Methodist, um, have let a segment take over leadership that has no idea who the living God is, has no mm -hmm. idea what scripture represents, has no idea of the, the foundational relationship that the Holy Spirit plays in all this. And they just want the power. And the, the church of 2024 has lost itself to those who sought power and not sought the Lord. And it, it's so hard to watch. Uh, we didn't write down our show notes. You want to talk a little bit about the United Methodists? Sure. I mean, there's, it's being overblown in the press. Methodists finally, after 50 years, recognize gay marriage. Well, it's because they split in half. Yeah, I know. And, uh, and those who were against it have left and formed the World Methodist uh, Church or Council. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, this is, uh, I think actually Jeff Walton made the observation, Jeff Walton, Juicy Ecumenism and the IRD, made the observation that the, uh, that the Methodists, now that they've lost their conservative wing, are going to leapfrog the Episcopal Church in the crazy, crazy stakes. And I hate to say this because I take such pride in the Episcopal Church, but the Lutheran Church, ELCA, Lutheran Church leadership, and the Methodist Church leadership are far wackier, wackier and whacked out than the Episcopal Church of the USA's leadership. We've been left in the dust. Uh, and this is true. I mean, when you read some of the things, and uh, but I mean, the wacky part of the Methodist Church and the wacky part of the Lutheran Church was pro-transgender um, uh, queer community almost uh, uh, five or six years before Tech even knew what it was. Uh, and it, you know, it, it's not hard to see how they came to this. It's it's just hard to see how the right people lost so much as they did in the Episcopal Church. You know, and um, is this a, a good time for us to be willowing uh, and, and drawing ourselves closer to God? Absolutely. Because of what people think of the church. There's a reason the church has lost the benefit of the doubt. And it's because uh, our larger denominations have split and the press makes, uh, the, the press has chosen sides as to who the winner in the split is. And... Well, yeah. I, I share Justin Welby and Pope Francis's hope that there can be a reunion of Christendom, but I don't see it forming in the same way they do. As I said, I have more in common with conservative Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, you know, all these people, you know, we worship the same God. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know the same Lord, but I can't say that about many Episcopal leaders. And so at a certain point, what am I going to say that, you know, uh, you, you know, people like Jack Spong were easy because they were such nut jobs. Um, but they, but, but they, that, they, that, they, that they, mild they, disbelief that yeah. is so destructive in the long term that it, so many bishops have. If you asked uh, Jack Spong, would he represent atheism more or Christianity more? He'd say, I'm probably more atheist. 
you know, he would be honest about it. Um, we've lost that honesty in conversation. And the biggest honesty here in conversation is I can't reunite with the Anglican Communion or the Episcopal Church or the Methodist Church or those leaderships until repentance is achieved. My repentance and their repentance, not to each other, but to God. You know, we are uh, at these horrible, uneasy times because we've fallen away. And there's only one yep. way back. You know? Yeah. The other thing, and I, 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 I'm hesitant to say this, but there's still a lot of hurt personal feelings on many levels. Sure. So that people are mad at what the Episcopal Church did to them. People are mad at what the Church of England did to them. And so in their new denominations, in their new places, they not only uphold the, the faith, but they still have that burning ember of animosity somewhere inside. And I'm reluctant to say this, but until they let go of that burning ember of animosity and allow that suffering to purify them instead of continue to burn and haunt them, we're not going to move forward. Yeah. We sometimes just have to let go of the crazy past uh, and just, you know, focus on the present and on what God has planned for us in the future and not continue to fight battles um, that uh, have been settled. Well, that's what Archbishop Duncan used to say. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. You know, and we can, if we get lost in these rabbit, rabbit trails, uh, uh, the church suffers. Well, he, the, he's, yeah. he's a good example because yeah. he was treated abysmally, uh, not just professionally, but people were cruel to him. They were cruel to his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, would say, it's one thing to say, you know, I disagree with your theology. I disagree with your policies. I think you're a nut job and leave it on that level. But to make it, but to personalize it even deeper that, you know, I don't like your wife. I don't like your face. I don't like what you think. You know, it, Bob Duncan had to go through a degree of uh, pain that uh, it's quite extraordinary for a man of God. And he came through it okay. Mm -hmm. That was still tough. Serve. It's tough. He's a retired archbishop. He's still serving today in a church. It's amazing to, to watch those struggles, but he had to give up a large portion of his pension. You know, and that's a lot of money if you're an Episcopal priest and you've served all your life in the church and you're a, a bishop. And, uh, you know, that was that's hard to see. It's just probably why he's still working today. Not on some island in Ireland, you know. Well, whatever. George, it has been a pleasure to speak with you again. This has been Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 855 of Anglican Unscripted. Oh, yeah.